it's not about the sweating. It's not about the hardcore sweating. If you ask me, the sweating is like the smallest benefit. I have five very key benefits that people don't usually talk about when it comes down to saunas. So let's go ahead and let's break them down. But first, I have to help you understand really quick that saunas are all about triggering stress in the body. It shouldn't be this super relaxing experience. It should be kind of difficult because you're trying to trigger an adaptation within your body that allows you to cope with the heat better. Okay from a molecular level, at a cellular level, mitochondrial level, and we'll touch on all of it and I'll keep it fairly high level, but we'll go and drill into some things. Hey, do hit the red subscribe button and then hit the bell icon if you don't uh, mind as well. And then after this video, I want you to check out my friends at Ujiro Matcha, which is a Japanese matcha company, 187 year old company. Check them out down below in the description. That way you can use that special link and you can get your hands on some ceremonial grade matcha. You can get your hands on some really good quality on the go stick pack matchas, but they also have matcha collagen, which is sweetened with stevia, so it's totally keto friendly and something that you could have shortly after breaking a fast if you're into that. So highly, highly recommend them. Super high quality stuff down below in the description and thank you Ujido for making this channel possible. Okay, so now that we know that saunas are a stressor and that's what we're after, we can learn a little bit about how they work specifically. Okay, so let's focus on number one, longevity. People don't think of saunas as a longevity tool, but if you look at a study that was published in the journal JAMA that took a look at over 2,300 Finnish subjects from Finland, okay, they looked at them over the course of 20.7 years, almost 21 years, okay? And they found that when they used saunas, it was dose dependent correlated with their overall longevity or their mortality rates, right? So they found that if they used a sauna three times per week, they were 24% less likely to die during the course of the study. However, if they used a sauna four to seven times per week, they were 40% less likely to die during the course of the study. Okay, so this is pretty interesting and it's a pretty big study that really tells us a lot. It doesn't mean you're magically going to live forever, but if you look at the data and you look at the mechanisms, here's what's probably going on. Okay, you improve your heart muscle contractions, which means your heart is beating a little bit better. Okay, it, it, the heart is stronger, but additionally, you improve sort of the pliability of the arteries. You reduce some of the stiffness within the arteries because it's trying to accommodate more blood flow that happens as a result of using the sauna. So therefore your arteries get a little bit more pliable, which reducing that stiffness is a very powerful thing. But then we have something called autophagy, which is where when your body is under stress, it reallocates and it really tries to prioritize the cells that are healthy. So it takes cells and components of cells that aren't functioning well and it breaks them down for fuel. So basically you are able to go through a survival of the fittest mechanism by using a sauna. This is gonna help you out with protein homeostasis as well. So what you are rebuilding is going to be higher quality. And then additionally, when you're under stress, your body produces something called heat shock proteins, just like the name implies. They come in as a result of heat shock. So the body says, I'm hot. These heat shock proteins come out and they actually help the body repair in a cleaner fashion through what's called the folding and unfolding of different proteins within cells, but we're gonna keep it a little bit higher level today. Number two is probably the main reason that I use Asana these days. Sure, I get the performance benefit out of it, but the big piece is the mental acuity and mood piece. When you sit in a sauna or stand in a sauna or jump rope in a sauna, you end up increasing your levels of norepinephrine. Okay, norepinephrine is like your fight or flight hormone. That alone is going to make you mentally acute if you allow it to. Okay, so sometimes if you get that fight or flight response, you go dumb because you just want to sprint. But if you put yourself in the right frame of mind, you actually get a benefit out of it. However, here's what's cool. It's the combination of the improvement in norepinephrine levels alongside the increase of something called prolactin. Prolactin is a hormone and one of the things that it can do is it ends up increasing what's called the myelin. And the myelin is the sheath that is the outer coating of a nerve. So what that means is you can send a better signal. So your brain can fire faster and it can actually send those crazy things that it needs to send to each different region of the brain, making you more mentally acute. We also have an improvement in BDNF, which is called brain-derived nootropic factor, which is allowing you to actually grow new neurons and new nerve cells within your brain. That's an added benefit with a whole different video on its own. But what's wild is the mood piece. Okay, if you've ever gone into a sauna, when you come out, you feel really good. There's a study that demonstrates that 20 plus minutes in a sauna triggers an opioid to be released. And this opioid is called dynorphin. Okay, and what this opioid does is it actually is not a good thing at first. Okay, it makes you kind of feel dysphoric. You don't feel right, okay? Now, what ends up happening is as a result, your body compensates by producing what's called beta endorphins. You know what endorphins are, right? They help you feel good. So while you're sitting in the sauna, you have this dynorphin and these endorphins that are like competing with each other. So you're kind of net neutral. But then when you get out of the sauna, 
the dynorphin drops and the endorphins stay high. So you feel really, really good. That's actually one of the reasons why I'm a fan of using a sauna for a short period of time before I work out. I like to do it because I feel like it gets me in the mental state. It gets my mood elevated because maybe some days I'm just not feeling it and I want to get my head in the game. Okay, then we move into number three, which is really a big focus for me as well. That's going to be using it to improve performance. This is wild. You see, being exposed to high heat acclimates your body to enhanced cooling mechanisms. It allows you to get better at cooling. And you may not realize it, but especially with endurance athletes, one of the reasons that they end up bonking is because their body heat gets too high and it slows down processes within the body. So if we can adapt to high heat, we enhance how we can cool, even internally. We also end up with more blood flow, okay, that means more glucose delivery, so more glycolysis. That means more free fatty acid delivery, that means more potential ketogenesis, that means more uh, beta oxidation, producing more energy from our actual energy substrates. Okay, then we also have an improvement in oxygen delivery, thus comes from an improvement in red blood cell count. Okay, here's a wild study, super wild, and if this doesn't convince you to use a sauna, I don't know what will. The Journal of Science in Medicine and Sport took a look at individuals that used a sauna for 30 minutes two times per week, okay? And they only did this for three weeks, and they found that if they used the sauna 30 minutes, two times per week, that they ended up having a 32% increase in their time to exhaustion when they were running. 32, so a third increase in their time to exhaustion. That's like me getting exhausted after running at, you know, for three minutes, and now after using a sauna for a couple weeks, for just two times a week, I can run to exhaustion at four minutes. Gained a whole minute on that, that is insane. And this comes as a result of a 7.1% increase in blood plasma volume, so a lot more blood, and a 3.5% increase in red blood cell count. So that's that much more oxygen getting to your cells. Insane. Okay, then let's talk about the mechanism of how we produce more red blood cells as a result of this whole thing. When you are slightly dehydrated, so especially like right after a workout, if you go and you sit in a sauna, what's gonna happen is what blood you do have left goes to the skin to enhance cooling, okay? goes to the blood ca uh, capillaries in the skin, helps you kind of vent and cool. Well, this triggers, okay, we're low in blood. So the kidneys, therefore, as a result, produce, you guessed it, EPO, okay? The kidneys produce EPO, which we all know as like a performance enhancing. We look at the guys in the Tour de France and there's always those scandals about EPO. Well, what if we can just hack our bodies a little bit to produce some? So this is gonna increase our blood volume, it's gonna increase our plasma volume, it's gonna increase our red blood cell count, so that we deliver more oxygen and get more nutrients and are able to catalyze things faster to ultimately create energy. But what good is performance without recovery? So number four is recovery. So here's the thing. Heat shock proteins scavenge the free radicals that occur after a workout without stopping protein synthesis. After a workout, a little bit of stress from oxidative damage is fine. It actually triggers a lot of good things. Remember, being under oxidative stress from a workout actually allows you to adapt. But there are some things like superoxide, which is a particular uh, oxidative damaging free radical that's in the body that causes a lot of damage after a workout. We do want to plummet that one. Heat shock proteins, those little scavenger kind of proteins that come in and chaperone the folding of proteins, they actually quell that. So basically, they lower oxidative damage while keeping protein synthesis high. So you can still rebuild muscle without having the oxidative stress. But what's really freaking cool is the growth hormone response. Okay, growth hormone signaling skyrockets because when you are in a sauna, it inhibits what is called the FOXO gene. Right after a workout, if you are expressing what's called FOXO, which is typically what's happening, it's triggering the catabolization of muscle, the breakdown of muscle. We don't want that, obviously. We just worked out. We don't want to be breaking down muscle. So if we can inhibit the expression of that gene, that pathway, FOXO, then we stop the breakdown of muscle. So what are we left with? building muscle, because normally when you consume protein, you have to counteract a little bit of the catabolization that's occurring. And then if we get rid of the catabolizing effect, then all of a sudden you're just building. It's hecka cool, right? You can tell I'm from California originally. So then when we get down to a really nitty gritty, if you want to go extreme, there are some studies that show that if you are willing to take the time and like don't have a family and don't have a life and spend two hours in a sauna a day, one hour in the morning, one hour in the evening at a very high heat and do that for a few days, there is a 16x increase in growth hormone and it lasts for hours after the sauna. So once you've been doing that for three days consecutively, then each time you go in a sauna, you get the 16x increase. So if you are taking a period of time to be specific for recovery, 
that could work out really, really well to be something where you just get this extra growth hormone response. The last one that I have to talk about is a huge one for me. Okay, I used to be 300 pounds and when I was that heavy, I did a lot of damage to my body. So I am in pain a lot. And quite candidly, one of the reasons that I use a sauna is for pain management. Okay, not only do I get the mood effect, do I get the opioid effect that actually soothes my pain, but it loosens everything up so I can actually move. Okay, now you might be wondering, should you use a dry sauna or an infrared? Infrared is going to heat you up inside the joints a little bit more. It's kind of like a low grade microwave that's cooking you from the inside. So that is okay for pain relief, but that's really good for getting warmed up. If you're actually looking for the endorphin effect and the opioid effect of actually sitting in a sauna, you want to use a dry sauna at a relatively high heat. Anyway, I know this was a lot of detail, but hopefully you learned something from it. And as always, please don't forget to subscribe and I'll see you tomorrow.